might not need any introductions. Those of you who haven't, uh, you're in for a treat. So, Cory Doktorov is a blogger, journalist, activist, science fiction writer. Um, you might have um, seen his work in Boing Boing, the um, long-running, very popular blog, or on the pages of Guardian, Wired, and many other publications. If you haven't read his science fiction books, for example, Little Brother, or the recently published sequel to that, Homeland, you might have uh, encountered his work as a, a copyright activist, one could say. So, uh, Corey will be here speaking today about the future of computing, and after that we have a short um, fireside discussion about topical subjects. There's enough of topical subjects this summer. Uh, and after that there's a chance also to meet, meet up and chat with Corey. But without further ado, please give a huge warm welcome to Corey Doktorov. Thank you, Kitos. Uh, thank you very much. So, uh, I write for a magazine you may have heard of called Make Magazine, and it's all about, about people who like to make things. And it comes out of scenes like this one, the demo scene, the case modding scene, hacking. People who discover that uh, just as with code, where you can share tips and learn from one another, um, with hardware you can also share tips and learn from one another. And if there's one thing I've learned hanging around with makers and reflecting on my own life, making things and learning to make things, it's that every act of making begins with an act of breaking, of unmaking. You take things apart that other people have made to see how they work, and you put them back together again to see if you can learn how to do it. So in 1977, my father uh, took the family and uh, put us on the back of our family dinosaur, and we went into downtown Toronto to see a new movie that had just come out called Star Wars. And um, Star Wars is a pretty good movie. I don't think it's the greatest movie ever made, but I was six years old. And in 1977 in Canada, six-year-olds didn't have many options for hearing about complicated stories. We had three channels on the TV, there was no cable, there was no VCRs, there were no DVD players, certainly no YouTube. And the kids' programming that we got, it was about as intellectually challenging as, say, Teletubbies. So Star Wars, for me, marked a, a turning point because it was the first time I ever saw a complicated story, a story where there were multiple points of view, where there were reversals, where the story wasn't told all in linear order. And having seen it, it just blew my lid. I went home, and I took paper, and I, I piled it up, and I stapled it down the side, and I, I trimmed it so it was the size of a paperback novel, and I wrote that story out over and over and over again, like a pianist practicing scales. And that's how I became a writer. That's what I do now. I write novels. And I started by unmaking something that someone else had made before, just like everybody does when they want to start learning. So in 1979, we got our first computer. It was an Apple II Plus. My dad was a computer scientist. He brought it home, and all of the games and all the programs for that computer were written in BASIC. Again, not the greatest programming language, but it had one important advantage, which is that because it was an interpreted language, you could list out the source code. And you could see how it was made, and you could remake it and make your own. And that's how I became a programmer. Um, uh, and then a few years later, a, a good decade later, I became, like so many people, a web developer. And how did I become a web developer? Well, HTML was not the greatest environment for building interactive applications ever, but it had this very important virtue, which was view source. The way that you became an HTML developer in those days, before there was any uh, uh, tutorials, before there was any instructional material, before even the specifications were settled, was by looking at how other people had, did it, had done it and, and rewriting it yourself. Uh, as Isaac Newton says, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Everything we do starts with the stuff that has come before us, copying the stuff that has come before us. Copying is not a bug, it's a feature. 
We are descended from organisms that through a process not entirely understood even to this day, four billion years ago, started to reproduce themselves. Molecules started to bump together in a way that made them into machines for making more molecules. We have a name for organisms that don't copy, and we call them extinct. Copying is built in. So when my daughter was born uh, five years ago, I live in London, uh, my family came over from Toronto for a visit. My mother, uh, her degree is in early childhood education. She, she teaches it. And we call her the baby whisperer. She's very good at figuring out how to take care of kids. So when she came to visit, when my daughter was only maybe a week or two weeks old, she said, um, have you stuck your tongue out at the baby yet? And I said, no, mom, I haven't stuck my tongue out at my newborn yet. Why would I do this crazy thing? And she said, oh, just watch. Now, the thing you need to understand about my daughter is she was only a week, two weeks old. And although she may have touched her face incidentally, as babies do when their hands are flailing around, she hadn't systematically explored her face and her body. She didn't really have that sense of what she looked like. She hadn't seen a mirror yet. She didn't really know that she had a tongue yet. But my mother took her granddaughter in her arms and did this. And my daughter looked back up at her and did this. Because we copy like we nuzzle for the breast. It's built in. For four billion years, we have been learning to copy in order to get better at being who we are. Right? That's how we acquire language. That's how we acquire all of our important skills. Everything in this room comes to us thanks to copying. But the law acts as though copying was not a feature, but rather was a terrible bug that had to be stamped out. The European Union Copyright Directive, the EUCD, embodies in it um, many elements that treat copying as though it's something to be stamped out and not something to be celebrated. And of those, the one that I'm going to focus on today is something called anti-circumvention. Now, all of you will have encountered um, uh, technologies that try to control how you use them, digital rights management technologies. So you have a console, and it will only play games that are signed by the manufacturer. Or you have an iOS device, an iPhone, or an iPad, or an iPod, and it will only play apps that are signed by Apple. Or you have a DVD, a uh, Blu-ray disc, and when you put it in your player, it says, I'm sorry, this was bought out of region. It was brought back from Asia uh, because it's some rare anime. Or you brought it over from America, and it refuses to play in your DVD player. And what the European Union Copyright Directive does is it makes it illegal to remove that lock, that digital rights management lock, even if you're not breaking the law in any other way. In other words, you buy a DVD, it's yours, it's your property, you bring it home, you have a DVD player, that's yours, that's your property. You want to watch the movie that's on the DVD in your DVD player, that's not against the law, but removing the lock for the purpose of watching the movie that you bought on the DVD player that belongs to you in your house that is yours, removing the lock itself has become a crime. Now, um, this is uh, bad for lots of reasons. And if you're a creator, if you're a game developer, if you're a writer, if you're a movie maker, um, there's uh, uh, good reasons to mistrust this kind of law. Um, because what it does is it transfers all the power and copyright from creators and their investors, you know, the companies that publish our works, it transfers it to the DRM vendors, the IT companies, and they end up having the ultimate control over your destiny. So think about this. Say you make an iOS game, right, a game for the iPhone, right? You've made it. It's your copyright. No one disputes that. And say I own an iPhone, and you want to sell your game to me, and I want to buy your game from you, right? No, nobody's pirating anything. But Apple doesn't want to put it in the Apple store. Or, Apple, um, uh, or, or you don't want to pay Apple 30% of the purchase price. At that point, the EUCD says that because you have to remove a lock to install code that Apple hasn't given its blessing to, that you are breaking the law if you sell your copyrighted work that you made to me. So this makes no sense at all. Uh, you wrote the game. 
your boss uh, uh, invested in the game, so presumably the copyright will, will be some arrangement between you, I want to buy the game. For some reason, the person whose wishes matter the most in this relationship are not the person who created the game, not the company that invested in the game, not the person who wants to buy the game, but rather some offshore IT giant whose money lives somewhere in the Irish Sea and whose only creative contribution to that game is to chain children to machines in factories in the Pacific Rim and have them stamp out skinny pieces of electronics. This is copyright gone berserk. But that's not the main reason that digital rights management is a big deal. After all, the number of people who make games for a living as a proportion of this room is very high, but the number of people who make games for a living as a proportion of the world is very low. Most people aren't in the selling copyright business, but most people still have a reason to be worried about digital rights management, and it's this. When we ask our computer to do something, run this program, copy this file, save that stream, we expect that our computers will say, yes, master. But what digital rights management requires is that our computers say, I can't let you do that, Dave. <laughs> Nobody wants an I can't let you do that, Dave program on their computer. Right? Nobody woke up this morning and said, do you know what I want? I want a laptop that lets me do less. I wonder if anyone's selling that laptop. I wonder if Microsoft's got a new operating system that lets me do a lot less, that disobeys me when I ask it to do something. Nobody wants that feature. It's an anti-feature. And so if that feature were easy to remove from your computer, you'd remove it. As soon as you asked your computer to do something and it said no, you'd go hunting around on your hard drive for a program with a name like HAL9000.exe, and you would drag that sucker right into the trash, right? If your computer won't let you do something, you would list the processes running on it, go to the task manager, and you'd look for a program running called something like HAL9000.exe, and you would click on it, and you would say, kill that process with extreme prejudice. So how is it that digital rights management manages to stay resident on our computers when nobody wants it and anyone who runs afoul of it will immediately delete it? Well, the way that it stays there is that our computers and our operating systems are increasingly designed to hide secrets from their owners, to lie to their owners, such that when you list out all the files in a directory and you go looking for a file called something like hal9000.exe, um, that file, even if it's there, your computer won't show it to you. And when you list all the programs, um, if that program is running, it doesn't show up in the task manager. Uh, when Sony decided to ship uh, 51 CDs, 6 million, uh, uh, 51 CD titles, 6 million CDs in 2005, and stop people from ripping them to their computers, they installed some software on those CDs that stealthily copied itself onto your computer and installed itself without asking you when you put the CD into your CD drive. And it, meant, it made your computer incapable of seeing any program or file that began with dollar sign SYS dollar sign. So if there was a program called dollar sign SYS dollar sign HAL9000.exe, it wouldn't show up when you listed out the files. And they did that so that they could run a program that would watch everything you did, check to see whether or not you were um, copying the CD from the CD back onto your hard drive, ripping it to an MP3. And if it saw you doing that, uh, it would kill that process. But the thing is that by creating a blind spot in your computer, by putting a moat in its eye so that there was a thing that your computer could not see, what they did was they blew a hole in its immune system such that um, every virus writer immediately started churning out viruses that started with dollar sign SYS dollar sign. After all, Sony had helpfully infected six million computers with this software that made it impossible for antivirus programs to see any file that started with dollar sign SYS dollar sign. That was what you wanted all of your malicious software to look like. Every time you have a hole in the, um, uh, in the operating system, in the immune system, you get uh, opportunistic parasites. So um, 
we have this legend or this story now about how our computers work because computers have really become part of the whole fabric of the world. Uh, it used to be that if you needed a microcontroller and a toaster or a computer or a car or a, a thermostat, that you would make a special purpose computer that could only run one program that would go into the toaster or the oven or the car or the thermostat. But these days, computers are so cheap that we just put general purpose computers everywhere. And what, what we say is, oh, well, this, this iPad, the reason it can only run programs that Apple has blessed and not programs that you might want to install that Apple hasn't given permission for is that it's an appliance. And appliances don't run all the programs. They just run some of the programs. But there is no theoretical model for a computer that can run every program except for one that erodes the profitability of a giant IT company. The closest approximation we have to that computer is a computer that can run every program but that has spyware on it out of the box, that is designed from the ground up to hide secrets from the computer's owner and user, to lie to the computer's owner and user, to run programs that watch the computer's owner and user and try to stop them from doing things that they want to do, regardless of whether or not um, those uh, programs are doing something legal or illegal. And it is really important that we don't legitimize this. It's really important that we turn this back because this is a very dangerous trend because as more and more of our world is built out of computers, more and more of our world, ironically, is being built out of computers that are broken by design, computers that lie and hide secrets by design. After all, everything in our world is made out of computers. This building, you know, even if you took all of the computers on these tables, out of this building. It would still be full of computers because this building would be non-functional without the computers that keep the climate control systems, the electrical systems, and all the other systems running. Indeed, if you took the computers out of this building, it would be uninhabitable in very short order. And if you didn't put them back, it would probably be permanently uninhabitable within a year or two because the computers are what keep this building going. In fact, this, this building you can think of it as kind of a giant case mod. This building is an enormous case for some computers that we happen to be standing inside of at this moment and for a few days. Just like your car is a computer that you put your body into that then hurdles down the road at 120 kilometers an hour, surrounded by lots of other people, also trapped in their computers, hurtling down the road at 120 kilometers an hour. Just like a Boeing 747 is a flying Sun Solaris workstation connected to some SCADA controllers in a very fancy aluminum case. And it's not just that we put our bodies into computers these days. Increasingly, we put computers into our bodies. So some of you are my age, some of you are a little younger. If you're my age, you probably grew up with the Walkman. If you're a little younger, you grew up with MP3 players like the iPod. Regardless of what technology it was, we have all logged enough punishing earbud hours that there will come a day when we will start to lose our hearing. And when that day comes, it is vanishingly unlikely that the hearing aid you get will be a piece of beige, retro, plastic, transistorized, analog electronics. That computer, that, that hearing aid is almost certainly going to be a computer that you put into your body with Bluetooth and uh, um, wireless interface and, and uh, uh, a full API for accessing it. And if that computer is designed to hide secrets from you and lie to you, that computer will know what you hear. It will be able to stop you from hearing things that are really there. It'll be able to make you hear things that aren't there and it'll be able to tell other people what you're hearing. So it's pretty important we get this right. And lest you think that that's merely science fiction, reflect on this. Uh, a researcher named Barnaby Jack, who just died in San Francisco a few weeks ago, last November, he gave a presentation in Australia at a security conference about the work he's done on implanted defibrillators. Now, these are amazing technology. If your heart starts to lose the rhythm, if you start to uh, um, uh, get a weak heart that puts your life in danger, you can go see the doctor and she'll anesthetize you and she'll cut you open and spread your ribs, reach into your chest cavity and attach a computer with a battery directly to your heart. And it listens to your heart beat. And if it hears your heart go out of rhythm, 
it gives you a little shock that puts your heart back into rhythm. It's amazing. It saves lives. It may save your life someday. It may save the life of someone you love. And these things, well, doctors want to be able to get telemetry off of them. They want to know what they're doing. They also want to be able to update their firmware. And that's a little messy to do with a cable because this is a computer that's inside your chest cavity. And so it's got a wireless interface. Everything's got a wireless interface. Our, this building is basically a microwave oven full of computers, right? Wireless is everywhere. And this thing's got a wireless interface. And that's where Barnaby Jack came in, because he showed that from 30 feet away, from 10 meters away, he could detect the wireless interface in your implanted defibrillator. He could rewrite the firmware to your wireless defibrillator, your implanted defibrillator. He could cause it to seek out other implanted defibrillators within 10 meters and flash their firmware too. And then he could cause them to deliver lethal shocks to their owners. Right? So this is not going to be a matter of life and death. This is a matter of life and death. And that's why it's vitally important that we start getting this right now that we understand now that there is no way to build a computer that hides secrets from its owner without putting its owner at risk. You don't want your computer to have an invisibility cloak in it that bad guys can use to hide themselves from you when they attack you through your computer. Our competitive free society rests on the ability to interoperate, to open, to understand, and to improve. Free and secure societies cannot coexist with ones where rules that enforce, w with rules that enforce secrecy about our devices. Now here we are, we're makers, we're gamers, we're hackers, we're into the demo scene, we case mod, we make our own games up. And that makes us the vanguard, and we must not allow ourselves to yield on this point. We must not allow policymakers to go down this road any further than they've gone, because now that computers are everywhere and in everything, every problem that we have is going to involve a computer, right? Because computers will be part of everything we do. And at every turn, we will have lawmakers who will arrive at the same solution to this problem that they arrived at to the copying problem. Can't you just make me a computer that runs every program except for the one that I'm upset about? And the answer is we can't. Uh, the answer is that if we try to do that, we will just end up redesigning computers that we depend on for life and livelihood. Computers that can see us, that can hear us, that know who our friends are, that know who, um, what we say to our friends, that know every intimate detail of our lives. Computers we take with us into the bathroom, computers that we keep by the bed. We will end up redesigning those computers to have spyware on them out of the box, to be designed to treat their owners as attackers and enemies. So it's our duty to tell our friends, our family, our kids, and most of all, our politicians that this can't solve our problems, that this will only make our problems worse, to understand that the internet and the devices we connect to it are not merely the next generation of video on demand services. They're not merely a better kind of telephone. They're not merely a perfect pornography distribution system that what the computers and the network that connects them are, is the nervous system of the 21st century. So there are organizations that work on this. Um, across Europe, there's the Free Software Foundation for Europe. There's the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And then within, Europe, within Finland, there's the Electronic Frontier Foundation Finland. And there's also the Pirate Party and all the other organizations that work for free and fair deals for people who use computers. This goes beyond hackers. This goes beyond programmers. This is everyone in the world, because everyone in the world relies on computers today. Thank you. Thank you for Thanks. Uh, talk. Um, now the next question is, do you have uh, anybody in the audience who would like to ask something regarding the, the talk? I know it's all very self-explanatory and not controversial at all, so uh, there's someone in the front row I there. I think there was someone yeah. there, yeah. Yeah, I would like to ask about Sony and these virus they made. Uh, has anyone anywhere made legal charges against Sony? Because they probably made few million or maybe a few billion dollars of damage with that 
and I don't think that that was only one. And I want to see all those who make that in jail because I have had to clean those programs myself as well. And there is only one solution. Format C drive instantly. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think so anyone, uh, I think Sony ended up getting slapped by, by um, fair trade organizations, but not, uh, f they didn't face any criminal sanctions, uh, which, you know, you're right, I agree with you. You know, particularly in the United States, there's a law called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act of 1986. It is an ancient computer law and a terrible one. Uh, in 1986, the American legislature wanted to figure out uh, how to make a law that prosecuted the bad kinds of hacking, you know, breaking into people's computers and deleting or corrupting their data, uh, or taking uh, confidential information and sharing it. And they didn't want to list all of the things you weren't allowed to do with someone else's computer, because that list would be long and uh, it would be out of date very quickly. So instead they said, anytime you do something unauthorized with a computer, you, you, you commit a felony. And um, along came terms and conditions, you know, that long screen of legalese you have to click through every time you want to do something on the internet that says, you know, by being stupid enough to use this service, you agree that we're allowed to come over to your house and punch your grandmother and eat all your food and make long distance calls and wear your underwear, I agree. Um, and uh, what um, the federal prosecutors in the United States started to do was that basically anyone they didn't like they knew that that person would have had to violate terms, of, terms and conditions because everybody violates terms and conditions. And they would go to them and they'd say, well, if you violated terms and conditions, you did something unauthorized, and since doing anything unauthorized is a felony, we can put you in jail, you'd better plead guilty. This is what they chased after Aaron Swartz at with, the, the, and um, what they've just convicted Bradley Manning on uh, um, is, is this computer fraud and abuse standard. But they didn't bring it against Sony, and that that's, uh, uh, illustrates the remarkable double standard here that um, when, when individuals violate terms of service that giant corporations set down, um, we are told that we've uh, uh, committed felonies, but when giant corporations do things that they are absolutely not authorized to do, and the Sony Root Kit ended up infecting 300,000 US military and government networks, they don't face any criminal prosecution, they just pay some fines. Any more? Okay, there is one. Yeah. about uh, the challenges of uh, someone else coming over and hacking us as technology more, uh, merges with human beings. Can you talk about a little bit about the empowerment that comes from the fact of uh, us becoming empowered by this technology, sort of a transhumanist agenda of taking control of our own lives by hacking ourselves? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I I'm a science fiction writer, so I'm always skeptical of things that start as literature and end up being predictions, because I think science fiction writers who try to predict the future are like drug dealers who sample their own product. It, it rarely ends well. But um, I, I, I am a staunch believer in improving our lives with technology. I stand here before you wearing eyeglasses. Uh, you know, in, a, in another era, I would have been a blind man, effectively. Um, I would have been economically almost uh, uh, at the end of my life you know, 10 years ago when my eyesight started to go. So of course I believe in the power of technology to improve our lives, but ultimately the reason that glasses work, the reason that um, hearing aids work, the reason that this microphone works is science. And what's science built on? Science is built on the idea that it's not enough to think of a cool way of doing something. You have to tell other people what you're doing and see if they can find mistakes that you may have made. You know, before science, we had alchemy. And alchemy was a lot like science, except you never told anyone what you'd invented. You kept it all a secret. And so every alchemist discovered for himself that drinking mercury was an incredibly bad idea. And for 500 years, alchemists didn't make any scientific progress. When they began to publish, when they told people how, what they were doing and how it worked, then their follies, their mistakes, were suddenly visible to everyone. And we got all of the advances that have me standing in front of you wearing my eyeglasses, having gotten off an airplane, talking into a microphone with a phone in my pocket while you sit under these lights. All of those made possible by disclosure, peer review, and um, transparency. 
if we are going to put computers into our bodies, if we are going to change our bodies with technology, we must do so in a way that reflects science and not alchemy. We must do so in a way that allows us to review the assumptions that go into the technologies in our bodies and around our bodies and in our air and in our water, to review those assumptions and discover for ourselves whether they're good ones, right? Otherwise, we'll, we'll all be doing the 21st century equivalent of drinking mercury. You know, we've been making jokes about neural interface beta testers for a long time, but the scary thing about being a neural interface beta tester isn't just that the technology may not be ready for prime time and you're putting it in your head meat, but also that if that technology is proprietary and no one can see how it works, you'll never know if they made stupid mistakes that put your life in danger. You won't be able to audit it. Other people won't be able to audit it. People smarter than you won't be able to audit it and tell you, my goodness, you shouldn't put that in your head. Cheers. Okay. All right. Um, I think we continue with the sure. first yeah. discussion. We have a few more questions at the end. And as I said, you're all welcome to come and have a chat with Corey after, after this discussion as well. Um, so uh, maybe you could start off regarding the same theme still and uh, and i think you somewhere mentioned that that if the um, copyright wars were bloody this following war which you're talking about now is going to be even worse what what, what have you uh, learned from the copyright what, what what should we do different this time around um that's a good question I think that what we've got going for us now that we didn't have in the era of the copyright wars is a much larger general audience for to speak in defense of computers, a much larger group of people for whom computers are critical to their lives. So, um, you know, take grandmothers. For some reason, nerds hate their grandmothers and they always use them as examples of people who are technologically illiterate. Um, my grandmother's not technologically illiterate but wasn't very interested in computers, I have to admit. Uh, until my uh, my daughter was born, right before then, I think she figured, you know, I've, I'm I'm in my I'm in my 80s. Uh, I have better things to do with the re few remaining years I have here on Earth than watch progress bars. But when my daughter was born, she realized that the only way she could spend more than a week or two a year in the company of her great granddaughter, because we live in in England and she lives in Canada, was to figure out how to video conference. So she went out and figured out how to video conference. It's not hard. Right? The reason she didn't do it wasn't because, she wasn't, a, was beca wasn't because she was a grandmother. It was because she had no reason to. And when she had a reason to, she did. And now, for her, questions about network policy, network neutrality, questions about technology regulation, these are not abstract questions that relate to fields that she has no direct stake in. These are about whether or not she gets to see her great-granddaughter. And so I think there's a huge difference now because whereas before there were people who said, well, they're breaking the internet, but it's just about lolcats and YouTube fart videos, who cares? Increasingly, the number of people who understand that the internet is the place where everything we do requires a network connection, uh, and it's that network that carries it, th that, that consciousness is spreading. I feel like we have a, a much bigger natural constituency for network freedom than we did before. So basically, using the same tools, but now the audience is uh, radically bigger. Yeah. That's what you're saying. Okay, uh, I mean, that's a good bridge to the... Uh, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the things that are, have been happening this summer and, and uh, regarding, re regarding, in a wider sense, the same, what you are also talking about. And it's, of course, the Snowden case and the privacy under pressure at the moment. Um, first of all, your reactions to the latest revelations a couple of days ago yeah well I mean there's children present so I don't know if I can use the words that I <laughs> used when I first heard about about uh, the um, interception capability that Snowden revealed but it was it was forceful I was I was I was uh, uh, even I who thought uh, who's paid pretty close attention to this I was alarmed and amazed by the amount of data that's retained the pool of people who can gain access to it and how much they can. The fact that the uh, head of the NSA lied directly about this to Congress, I found amazing. Um, you know, uh, uh, Glenn Greenwald and, and Edward Snowden had intimated that they could do this with the first round of disclosures about PRISM. Uh, that first video of Snowden that, that Greenwald recorded in Hong Kong, 
uh, had Snowden saying, you know, I could, if, if, if I wanted to, I could sit down at a computer, type the president's name into it, and read all of his emails, see all of his phone records, and so on. And Snowden said, no, and, and uh, General Hayden, who's the head of the NSA, said that's absolutely untrue. And the thing that we've learned this week is that it's absolutely true. And it's not just government spies, but it's people who work for no-bid military contractors, right? You know, these are, these are the, the, you know, outside personnel who nevertheless have access to all of this. It's, it's a remarkable state of affairs. Uh, when this thing holds, uh, started a week into it or something, you wrote in, in The Guardian an article, I have to check here, but the, the NSA priest, why we should care. Mm -hmm. um, could you re reiterate for us now why we have to care about this? Yeah, I think a lot of people um, said, oh, well, why should we care about privacy at all? Uh, does it really matter that the NSA is spying on us? And there's, there's some really good reasons to care. One good reason to care about privacy is that um, although you may not care about it now, it's one of those things that people tend to care about after the fact. So you make a disclosure and then sometime in the future you get bitten in the butt by your disclosure. And so um, it's in the realm of things like uh, um, overeating or smoking where the consequences are so far away from the actions that we tend to have a hard time getting good at it. You know, um, when I was eight years old, I had a teacher who uh, went into hospital uh, with his wife to deliver their first child. And after their child was born, uh, a marketing person came around on the maternity ward, as, as is pretty common actually in, in Canada, I think even still, ca came around and said, we have this basket of uh, care supplies for newborns. There's uh, uh, nappies and wipes and, and formula and all the rest of it. And all we want from you, the trade we'd like you to make, is a little bit of private information. Tell me your child's name and tell me your address. And every year on the child's birthday, we'll send you things that are relevant to your child as, as she grows up. And that, I think, to most of us, sounds like a, a reasonable trade. It's, it's a, only a little bit of information. Your name and your birthday, big deal. It's in the public birth records. Your address, that's in the phone book. Who cares, right? And you get all this free stuff. But sometimes kids die, and their kid died. For no reason anyone ever put their finger on it happens. And every year on their dead child's birthday, they got a basket from these marketing companies full of things that their kid would have needed if their child had lived. And I think in hindsight, they realized that they'd made a really bad privacy trade. So when you trade your privacy for things, or when you can't imagine why a piece of private information becoming public could possibly cause problems for you, I think you're a bit like the person who says, how bad could smoking be for me? You know, uh, the first time I, I smoked for about half of my life, and the first time I took a puff off a cigarette at the time, didn't seem like such a big deal. And to be honest, almost every puff of every cigarette every person's ever had didn't cause them harm. But every now and again, you get a puff that mutates your DNA and gives you lung cancer. And if you smoke long enough, you will have that puff. And most privacy disclosures that you make or that are made for you by spies will not cause any harm to you. But if you make enough privacy disclosures over time, Eventually, one of them is going to cause tremendous harm to you. So that's one reason. It's another important reason, which is that privacy is not secrecy. You know, I know what you do when you go to the bathroom, right? It's not a secret. But it takes a remarkable person to want to do it in public. I know what your parents did to make you. It's not a secret. Same thing my parents did to make me. But again, unless they were exceptional people, they probably didn't want to do it in public. Being able to choose what parts of your life you disclose is the definition of the ability to have a personal life, not a private life, not a secret life, but a personal life. And that's important too, because we do important things in our personal lives. We are all here as the consequence of things that people did in their personal lives. And then uh, I guess the last part is that you and I, I presume, are lucky uh, I presume this about you, are lucky in that most of the details of our lives, even if they might be embarrassing, would not be all that harmful. We're not, we're not worried about sharing information about our sexual orientation that we have to hide. We're not worried about having political beliefs that are unpopular where we live that we have to hide. We are privileged 
to have a skeleton-free closet. But there are people that we care about, people that we love, who have had to be able to decide when and how they disclose personal information about themselves at the risk of enormous personal cost. And just because we got lucky in the lottery of where we were born and the circumstances of our lives, that doesn't mean that the people who didn't get lucky have some personal failing or don't deserve our sympathy. And to say because we've never had any reason not to, not to hide our disclosures, your, dis your reasons for privacy are invalid is monumental arrogance. And we hear from millionaire Silicon Valley CEOs like Mark Zuckerberg that if you don't have anything, that if you've got something to hide, there must be something wrong with you. And it represents a state of such towering privilege and absolute callous disregard for the least among us that it's really a, a shameful thing. Is it even true for, for the normal person? Well, I think, you know, Cardinal Rishi Lu once wrote that if you give me six lines in an honest man's hand, I can find in them a reason to hang him. You know, it is true that if you find enough correlations about someone, uh, spurious correlations about someone, that somewhere in them will be something that will be hard to explain. Even if, it do, even if you've never done anything wrong, the combination of all the places you've been and all the people you know can be made to, to look like they're correlated with some bad, um, uh, bad effect. That's why in criminal cases, we don't allow circumstantial evidence because mere circumstances don't tell you anything about someone's guilt or innocence. But once you have these unaccountable database-driven systems of guilt, that uh, like the no-fly list, we see that simply having given money to the wrong charity or having been in the wrong place or used the wrong search terms or had the wrong friends can result in a major loss of uh, important civil rights like the right to travel um, and your, your name on an unaccountable no-fly list. Is there a danger, I think it was Jeff Jarvis who said that in an interview I heard this earlier this week, that, that we're focusing too much on the dark side, on the danger, and not enough on the possibilities and the good that come, can come out of this. What, what's your take on, on, on that? Well, you know, uh, I think that um, sharing and being able to choose what you share is important. Um, I think that right now we don't have tools that let you choose what you share. Um, we have tools that just hemorrhage your information. So your browser, when you go to a web page, may uh, set and serve 100 cookies, 200 cookies. And your choices are turn off third-party cookies, and then half the web stops working altogether, or keep third-party third cookies on, in which case everything that you, every piece of your personal information gets hoovered out of your browser, or have uh, ask me every time I want to set a cookie turned on, in which case you have to make 500 decisions every time you go to a website, which doesn't work. Our browsers are broken, right? They, they don't allow us to make meaningful privacy choices. And J I know Jeff, and I think he's a good guy, but you know, he talks about things like a privacy marketplace, where you trade your privacy for services. And even if we believe that people can make that trade, you know, uh, uh, even though there are all these problems with people getting good at privacy because of the cause and effect being separated by so much time and space, even though people may be able to make that, even if you think people should be able to make that trade, they're not making that trade now. The way the trade works now is, you'll take whatever service I give you, and I will take all of your private information from you. And that's not a marketplace, that's a smorgasbord. Um, you were alluding to, uh, to it earlier as well when you were saying that, that almost everybody today is affected by computing in one way or another, so the constituency is quite big at the moment. But at the same time, aren't we seeing uh, problems, uh, if, if you think about the NSA situation and other problems, where the competence isn't there, where, where the legal, moral, ethical um, uh, debates don't have time to, to happen in, in, in the same pace that technology changes? What, what, what should we do to correct this uh, aspect? So I do think that there are elements of technical ignorance that lawmakers may, um, possess that, that result in bad law. I think that lawmakers are accustomed to thinking of complicated things as having some regulatability. So, you know, if we show that car phones increased accidents, 
lawmakers naturally think that they can order cars not to have car phones and that they can do so without committing, you know, gross violence to the underlying idea of a car. A car without a car phone is still a car. And so they think that you can say, okay, well, make me a computer that doesn't have the copyright violation program in it, and that that will work too. And that's not true, that cars are special purpose and computers are general purpose, and there's no general purpose minus one, whereas special purpose things can have features added and removed. And that's true. But I don't think that's the whole story, and I don't think that's what happened with the NSA. I think that the NSA spying and GCHQ spying in the UK and, and other spying across Europe was not the result of lawmakers being ignorant. I think it was the result of regulatory capture by military contractors and by creepy spooks who had no adult supervision. I think that what we saw there was, was plain and simple political corruption. You know, if you look at the, um, there was just this, this critical vote, uh, a representative named Amish uh, put forward a, a, a bill in Congress in the United States to remove funding from the NSA for the kind of surveillance that they've been doing. And that vote came within just a few hands of carrying. And if you look at the votes in favor of continuing surveillance, those Congress people got more than double the money from the defense industry, the industry that benefits from selling the equipment to do the spying, than the ones who voted against it. That's not ignorance. That's just corruption. They were bought and paid for. And so Lawrence Lessig, who's one of the great thinkers about how computers uh, w change society and how to regulate computers, he, he talks about um, the copyright wars and other specific battles about uh, technology as being uh, an irrelevance because until we fix the political process, we're just going to be trying to, uh, you know, bail out this, this leaky boat with a, with a teacup. And, you know, he proposes changes to the way campaign finance works as a way of, of changing the way that, that uh, alignments go. And I think that that probably has some future. Uh, we have rampant visible corruption in our governments. The United Kingdom where I live, for example, it was just revealed that the National uh, uh, Secret Police, the SOCA, or the British equivalent of the um, FBI, uh, suppressed information about law firms, rich individuals, prominent law firms, rich individuals, and major corporations that had um, hired criminals to illegally hack into the private information of their enemies, and that they suppressed this for years, and that they then went and disclosed it to a judge, Lord Justice Levinson, who conducted an inquiry into the newspapers doing this, and he suppressed it, and that they've given it to Parliament, and Parliament won't publish the names of these corporations and high-profile individuals who hired criminals to commit gross crimes. Um, and that's just, you know, this is not an example of technical incompetence in the police. And it's not an example of technical incompetence in the judges. And it's not an example of technical incompetence in parliament. This is gross corruption. These are people who, in order to protect the establishment and its legitimacy, are unwilling to follow the laws. Do you see? Do you see that the tide is turning now? Though I mean, um, uh, there are quite uh, a lot of voices in the mainstream asking questions now. Uh, one example I, I, I heard John like Carre speak about very wordly about this just a few days ago, and and you hear it in in media where you went, where you're not used to hearing about these problems. Do you think it's going to change? Of course, we have the history of the 9/11 and all those uh, draconian laws that that and the whole discourse that happened after that, but is, is this a moment that it's going to get a bit better again? So here's what I think. I think that, as the, that the NSA leaks have shown us what so many of us have said for years, which is that computers used without any moral center, without, without uh, any checks on the government, uh, can, can make a nightmare out of society. Uh, something that makes George Orwell look like My Little Pony, and it wasn't supposed to be a manual. Lesson. It wasn't supposed to be a manual. 1984 was not a manual for statecraft. Um, we, that that that's what technology can do if we don't do something to ensure 
that it is primarily aimed at liberating instead of enslaving, at freeing instead of surveilling. But the other thing I think about this is that technology allows us to work together in ways that we've never seen or dreamt of before, and that the ability to work together is really the, it's the critical dream of, the, of, the, of our species. You know, how do we become human? Well, it started with hominids, early hominids, who um, became tribal instead of operating in individuals or family groupings. And we developed this, at, this, at that time, our ancestors developed this part of the brain called the neocortex, and it wraps around the outside of your brain. It means uh, the new bark, right? So it's like the last ring of bark around a tree, the newest ring of bark. And the neocortex is there in, in part to help us manage our social relationships because that's what you need to be able to do if you're going to work together, right? If we're going to say, all right, you're going to be the monkey that looks after the kids. I'm going to be the monkey that looks out for tigers. That's going to be the monkey that goes and gathers the fruit. We need to know whether we can trust the other monkeys, right? Because, like, you don't want to find out that I'm not looking for tigers and instead I'm sleeping under a bush the hard way, right? Everything that we do together, we pay a tax, and that tax is the coordination cost. It's the effort that we spend not doing the thing that we came together to do. It's the time that we spend talking about how we're going to do the thing that we came together to do. It's meetings and phone calls and emails and memos and whiteboards and Gantt charts and flow charts and org charts, bureaucracies. All of that is the tax that we pay on our collective effort. And what computers do is radically lower those transaction costs to allow us to do things as groups that we've never done before. So when I was an activist in Toronto in the 1980s, 98% of my time was stuffing envelopes, writing addresses on them, putting stamps on them, and putting them in the mail, and 2% of the time was figuring out what to write on the sheet that we put in the envelopes. Come to a demonstration on Saturday. Write to your member of parliament. Now we get the envelopes and the mailing lists. We get them for free. Right? We have this enormous surplus that we never had before, and it lets us pull off incredible things like the fight over SOPA, where uh, an American copyright law that everyone had identified as a sure thing was knocked back by activists, but, but also things like Wikipedia and, and Linux, which, you know, they're on the order of complexity as a build, of a building like this. You know, they're, they're about the same kind of complexity, and yet they were built without a big company and a set of blueprints and a, a, a hierarchy and authority. It's as though we said, you know, I have this big plot of land on the outside of, of Helsinki, and if you have any architectural drawings or furniture or structural steel or sound insulation or ideas about how we could put it together, just come down whenever you have any spare time and help me build the hockey arena. And 10 years later, we had a hockey arena, right? Not, not a pile of garbage, right? Not, not an unlivable wreck, but an amazing hockey arena. That's what we got. You know, and people say, oh, predict the future, science fiction writer. And I say, if you want to predict the future, imagine something as hard as building a hockey arena or running a country or uh, putting a rocket into space and imagine it being done the way that we do Wikipedia, the way that we do Linux, right? Where the transaction costs have been lowered so much that things that were formerly things where you had to subsume your individuality, your ethics, your, your um, uh, choice uh, into a larger group, you can express those and still manage to work together. And that gives me hope. It gives me hope that we can build the kinds of institutions and organizations that can repel the forces of reaction, surveillance, snoopiness, authoritarianism, control, greed, and corruption, that with transparency and radical new ways to work together, that we can change the world. Not that we must, not even that we will, but that we can. Computers aren't going to go anywhere, right? If we decide, oh, computers are merely a corrupting influence, um, we should just abandon them as a tool for fighting for justice. The other side will continue to spy on us with computers. They will continue to use computers to control us. The only difference will be 
that we'll be fighting with one hand and one leg tied behind our backs because we won't be using computers to fight back. Uh, which actually brings me to, you, you, in your novels, uh, there's a couple of uh, books you've written to, 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 to younger audiences, and it, they actually talk about this, what, what you as a young hacker can do in, in, uh, towards these questions. What, what, there's, I guess there's quite a lot of young hackers around, young and older. What, what's your, what, what should they do, be doing in this situation? Well, so regionally i think that everyone should should get involved with groups like electronic frontiers finland uh you know the the new initiative that has just been put through to reform copyright law was accomplished not just by drafting legislative text but by working within networks using good code you know working within individual networks of people who cared about this stuff and reaching out to them they need uh, the kinds of hackers who can write the kind of good code that can make a big difference. And now, you know, there's a new legislative initiative to uh, um, make Finland a country that would extend uh, uh, would extend uh, asylum rights to people like Edward Snowden, which could make a huge difference. And those are causes that you can fight on right away. Contributing to and making free and open source software is a huge thing that you can do. Um, and also uh, making choices about the technology that you make and use, helping the people around you understand the subtleties of, of proprietary versus open source and free software. I mean, this is the country that gave us Linux. You know, this is the country where everyone should be using it uh, because uh, uh, Linux is a place, uh, Linux is a system that uh, allows you to audit it and make sure, unlike, say, Skype, which it turns out, is filled with back doors to allow the Chinese government and the Iranian government and the American government to spy on its users. Um, you know, Linux can at least be audited so we can see if there's bad things in there. You know, it's, it's, it's software that you don't have to trust the makers because you can go and check for yourself. And there's always projects within Linux that need your support. Um, particularly if there's one thing that I want hackers to make easier, it's good crypto software. Um, make PGP easier to use. Make full disk encryption by default easier to use. Um, uh, improve SSL. Work on certificate transparency, which is a Google initiative to make it harder to spoof um, uh, signing certificates and SSL certificates so that we can trust our, our network connections better. These are all projects that need more effort to make them more usable and cleaner and more reliable. Yeah, and actually, you were talking about. We got a few more minutes here. We can we can continue the discussion. Uh, there was, uh, of course, you, you mentioned the copyright law, uh, the initiative, the draft law that was put put forward. There's also another one now. I don't know if you have heard about it, uh, Lex Snowden. I just mentioned that. Yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. that, that's true. Um, what's your what's your take on those? Well, I, I I certainly think that one of the things Snowden showed us is that when you've been made stateless by your country, right, when a corrupt government takes away your passport, you are really in trouble because even if there are countries that would accept you as an, as, an, as an asylum claimant, they require you to first get there in order to claim asylum. And without a passport, it's hard to travel. And so um, allowing f uh, people to uh, claim asylum in, uh, in, in a country without having to physically get to it, to be able to say, go to an embassy and claim asylum and then be issued a temporary travel document so that you can get there, closes that loophole. And so I'm, I understand if you Google Snowden for president, is that right? Uh, that you'll find this, this uh, direct initiative uh, to change Finnish law to make it happen. If you make it happen by this winter, you can just get him to Petersburg, wait for the ice to freeze. He can walk to Helsinki. <laughs> So everybody should go signing the, right. the petition now at this moment. Okay, hey, uh, many thanks. Uh, let's see Thank if you. there's some questions in the audience uh, regarding these uh, discussions that we, we, we had here. Anybody want to comment something or, or ask another question? There's a couple of hands yeah. now. Do you know about the game called Remember Me when uh, people can share their memories for services. No, I don't. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't played it, sorry. Okay, it's based on the future. Uh -huh. So you can uh, share your memories and good and bad ones. And then you can buy something or just so that other people know. 
Well, I mean, certainly, like, games are a really powerful teaching tool, and one of the ways to get good at something is to practice it. I think we don't have many practice arenas for privacy, you know, uh, and, and so if we, do, if we can make simulations and games and tools that create low-stakes environment where we can learn uh, about privacy, that would be great. Yeah. But um, do you think the future should be like that or will it turn like that? Uh, like well, I don't know. I mean, I think basing an economy on disclosure of memories um, kind of uh, the only way that I can actually see that working as a form of monetary policy is if we no longer need money. And so if we reached a point of non-scarcity and abolished all money, then I think that things would be very different. Uh, and, um, and I have no strong predictions about what a post-scarcity world would look like, uh, although I do have some fun ideas. There was another hand, I think, there. Yeah. Yeah, you talked about the openness of computers, that it's important to require uh, for your own devices and the stuff you work with that they're open and you can see into them. Uh, how do you think it would be possible to extend this kind of openness into networks and into communications? Because it's not enough to know what your computer does. You mm -hmm. also need to know what happens on the other side, end of the wire, that your data is transferred securely and, and it's, it's handled in a meaningful way. Uh, how do you think uh, this kind of transparency mm -hmm. should be pursued? Well. So there's two separate questions there. The first is how you trust the endpoint, right? Wh whether you trust that the endpoint honors the secrecy that you've asked them to handle the data with. So if I send you an email, even if I can trust that the email is, is encrypted all the way to you, I, I don't know how, I, the, the question of how I know that you're the kind of person I should be writing that email to is I think not a technical issue, although it's a very, very important one for security. But um, the, the first piece of how do we trust that a communication between two endpoints is secure is, is thankfully one of the bits that we know how to solve pretty well. Uh, as, as Jacob Applebaum from WikiLeaks says, the universe wants us to keep secrets. There is this amazing thing woven into math, into the fabric of the universe, where scrambling a message takes trillions of times less computing power than descrambling it by brute force. And so until quantum computers are here or someone figures out a, a much more elegant way of factoring out the products of large primes, we have this ability to um, encrypt messages such that only the people who have private keys uh, can, can receive them uh, at either end. Now, that, that doesn't take account of things like computers being infected by malicious software that allows for intercepting of the keys or intercepting of the clear text after the keys have been entered. It doesn't account for things like ubiquitous cameras and maybe cameras on drones that read over your shoulder and see everything that you, you, that you type or everything that comes up on your screen. Um, but that one piece, transmitting data from point A to point B, that piece is actually well understood, and, and, it's, and it's, I think it points to all the other research areas that we need to start addressing. Okay, I think this is, must be a sign for us. I think so. <laughs> I think that we're being played off by keyboard cat yes, over there. Exactly. Thank you. Hey, many thanks, Corey. Thank you very much, Simon. Very nice. Uh, all right, cheers. Thank you. Give a big hat to Corey.